So the first speaker I'm going to introduce is Dr. Melissa Parker, who is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at McMaster University. Uh, and I got to tell you, uh, one of the first talks I ever saw with the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group was Dr. Parker uh, when I was still an ICU fellow and sort of helped inspire my career as a clinician scientist in the space. Uh, so I'm uh, delighted to introduce her and the title of her talk is Lessons from a Pediatric Clinical Trial, Where to Next? Dr. Parker. Thank you. That's the highest flattery to say you've inspired one of your colleagues uh, who's gone on to an illustrious career. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk on this uh, topic. Uh, clinical trials are, of course, challenging, and uh, I would argue that things are, are even more challenging in pediatrics, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about why about that during that talk. Uh, I have no conflicts uh, relevant to this talk, uh, other than the fact that I'm a sepsis researcher. So we're going to talk a little bit about the specific challenges in conducting pediatric clinical trials, some of the things that we've learned uh, in conducting SQUEEZE, and of course future directions in pediatric sepsis trials. So what are some of the specific challenges in pediatrics? Uh, well, in terms of the population, this ranges from neonates all the way up to 18 years of age. And of course, there are big differences between neonates, infants, children, and adolescents who management can be bordering on uh, management that's more simil similar to adults. And all of that needs to be taken into account when designing a clinical trial. Baseline status, their vital sign norms vary by age, unlike in adults where uh, you know, MAP, uh, MAP greater than 65 may be your target. Uh, those targets are going to differ by age. And there's a smaller pool to recruit from versus adult trials. And, and this really was highlighted during the pandemic. All of the pediatric ICUs are in academic tertiary care centers, whereas much of the ICU care of adults actually takes place in community ICUs. So critically ill children are all transported to uh, tertiary academic centers and so frequently in order to achieve larger sample sizes and even those sample sizes are much smaller than adult trials um, many centers are required and and often there are, are efforts to make trials international recruitment is slower for the same reason and more sites are needed to reach a given sample size what about the intervention and comparator selection well again this needs to account for differing uh, age and size of patients, uh, weight-based dosing, and developmental levels uh, if your outcome measure is uh, some sort of uh, neurodevelopmental assessment, for example. Um, this was highlighted actually in Squeeze because fluid resuscitation in children is based on per kilo dosing. And we actually fortunately recognized very early before we started recruiting that if we had a 100 kilo adolescent, then it didn't make any sense to give a bolus of two liters. Interestingly, um, one of the adult trials actually made a protocol change during the trial when they, they actually came to the same realization. In terms of the outcome, uh, fortunately in pediatric critical care, mortality is actually very low. The mortality rate in pediatric ICUs is around 2% in Canada. Of course, uh, in septic shock, that it's higher. It's somewhere between 5 and 10%, but that, that vastly differs than uh, in other countries in, in Africa, for example, where mortality can be as high as 70%. But for that same reason, uh, mortality is rarely an appropriate primary outcome for pediatric uh, clinical trials. Uh, as such, there uh, needs, needs to be use of other outcome measures, such as uh, surrogate or composite outcome measures, and they may actually be less meaningful to clinicians and harder to interpret. So when you're designing your study, you really need to be thinking several steps ahead and, and know that your trial ultimately is probably going to become part of a meta-analysis. And so you do need to collect things like mortality as a secondary outcome. Um, other issues. So research processes can't necessarily be just simply transposed from adult trials to pediatric trials. A good example of that is um, funding trials with per-patient uh, uh, recruitment uh, compensation. There needs to be a certain level of baseline infrastructure in children's hospitals to actually support pediatric research, again, because uh, 
the number of patients that are recruited is generally smaller, and so to support the research endeavor, research staff, and so on, um, there needs to different funding models need to be need to be utilized. The the other issue is that there's really no cross subsidization. There's very few industry trials in pediatrics, and so um, it's not like that infrastructure is being otherwise funded through uh, industry trials, and uh, that uh, that investigator initiated research can can lean on, if you will. Um, to help support uh, trials that are um, that uh, are uh, require more funding. In terms of screening, again, getting back to things like vital signs, you're going to have to uh, consider things like vital sign norms that are going to vary across uh, your population that you're recruiting. And so we actually had a specific uh, sheet for that to kind of help guide through uh, screeners uh, for squeeze, uh, consent and assent. Again, this is going to vary by age in terms of the capacity of your patient, and not only based on expected developmental norms, but of course children can have other medical issues that can affect their capacity independent of their age-expected um, development. And interestingly, you know, consent uh, and assent requirements uh, vary across countries, but in Canada they actually vary by province as well, and this further complicates things along with the fact that consent and assent need to be ongoing and really not just at a single point in time. And I've already touched on the budget issues. So, as I said, everything takes longer in squeeze, and so this, this uh, trial was really conceptualized a very long time ago now and uh, has taken a, a very long time to complete, but uh, it's, it's certainly satisfying to have, have completed enrollment. The results are not out yet. Um, but hopefully we'll bring those to you soon. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, this trial. Uh, the first aim actually is the clinical trial and we looked at a fluid sparing uh, resuscitation strategy versus usual care, uh, which is fluid rib liberal. Perhaps less so now than when the trial was initially uh, conceived. And at the time that uh, I first presented this uh, and discussed it with some colleagues, I had at least one um, senior colleague tell me that they thought it was crazy. Um, interestingly, since we launched the pilot, there were subsequent adult studies, which again, because of faster recruitment, were able to um, uh, recruit to completion, and, and uh, I'll show you those in a minute. Um, but uh, our study is not out yet, but uh, watch this space. We also, um, fortunately, with the funding we, um, we uh, were fortunate to obtain, we're able to embed uh, translational research in, in the trial, and I think this really is best practice in terms of trying to support uh, translational research, which is so important for sepsis in terms of biomarkers and where things are going in the future. And the third aim, uh, again, because resuscitation trials and certainly squeeze that required early recruitment uh, needed to use an exception to consent model, so we actually, again, innovative at the time, uh, wanted to actually study the experiences of substitute decision makers, which are not always parents. They can be children's aid society, they can be grandparents, they can be foster parents and so on. And, and certainly we've, we've talked to all of those types of substitute decision makers as part of this qualitative research. So this is kind of, in, in simple form, this is, uh, this is the uh, comparator versus the uh, intervention which was fluid sparing. But in practice, it actually was much more complicated because it was a combination of both fluid restriction as well as early initiation and escalation of uh, vasoactive medication support. And I won't get into that today um, for the reasons of time. So really, you know, think sepsis can, it can start anywhere, and so we didn't want to limit recruitment to the ICU because, of course, most of the resuscitation starts in advance of uh, patients arriving to the ICU. So we wanted to recruit broadly. We recruited uh, from the emergency department, from medical wards through the medical response team, and flagged patients who were incoming uh, by the transport team, basically if they had shock and if they uh, were receiving more than one fluid bolus. So uh, patients were identified by clinicians. They were screened if they met the uh, eligibility criteria. They were immediately randomized. Uh, randomization time was within minutes from uh, confirmation of eligibility within the pilot. And then the intervention was rapidly begun with an aim to begin that within an hour, and we were successful with that as well. And then, of course, because deferred consent was used, uh, consent happened after the fact. And unlike uh, classic and clovers, uh, 
one of the interesting things I think about squeeze and the intervention is the intervention duration was actually for the entire duration of time that the child was in shock. So I think the longest we had a kid in shock in the pilot was 16 days. I had guessed maybe two weeks would be the longest, but yeah, we actually, uh, in terms of our uh, data collection form, uh, ran out of space and uh, so had to take some additional notes to record a couple more days of uh, data. So one of the things, obviously, that came up in designing this trial was, well, when exactly should we approach patients, uh, or in this case, usually they're substitute decision makers, to discuss the fact that they'd been enrolled in a trial and, and to go through uh, fully informed consent. And looking at the Tri-Council Policy Statement, which in Canada is our, our go-to um, document to guide uh, ethical conduct of research, uh, while Exception from consent is, you know, a recognized and approved uh, model by which children can be, or, and adults can be enrolled into research because some research isn't possible without that uh, consent model. There's really no guidance uh, about how to actually do that on the ground. So we learned a lot. Uh, we learned a lot in terms of randomization. We learned about how blackouts can bump your uh, telephone-based randomization system uh, offline, and so we moved to red cap-based randomization. We learned about uh, the experiences of, of substitute decision makers in terms of timing of consent approach, what happened when actually the patient died and we had to consider whether to seek waived consent versus actually um, approaching them after the fact. And so, um, as I said, we, we have qualitative research, which again uh, is not out there yet, but we, we've pre presented some of that at uh, Canadian Bioethics Society uh, meetings in the past. But uh, for the definitive trial, we actually will have qualitative um, research um, from across the country, um, from substitute decision makers and, and actually some participants. So probably the biggest thing or the biggest learning, I would say, uh, in terms of trial processes was really around consent. And I, I won't dwell on that further for, the, for reasons of time, but um, things are complicated. They may sound straightforward on paper, but when you actually are thinking about how you're actually going to do things and the mechanics of uh, how it's going to work, uh, things that may seem straightforward are, are not. Uh, I do want to say that, unfortunately, when I started this work, uh, there was no uh, harmonization of uh, research ethics boards across the province. In fact, even in Ontario, CTO wasn't live yet. And so we had to go through individual REBs, first in Ontario and then in other provinces, and then ran into, of course, uh, different REBs having different questions. We also learned that some REBs want to see and approve the protocol first. Other, other sites actually want the contract first. So really, this is enough to drive an investigator crazy and certainly cost a lot of money in terms of research staff and time. So something that you may not be aware of is CHEER. Uh, it's the Canadian Collaboration for Child Health uh, Efficiency and Excellent excellence in ethics review of research. And this is actually an initiative funded by CIHR to try and harmonize uh, research across the country to try and help uh, reduce uh, time and increase efficiency of uh, research review. So where do we go from here? Well, the type of uh, fluid for volume resuscitation is certainly topical. That's not something that we actually studied in, in, in squeeze in terms of a research question, but we have collected that data, so we will have some rich dad, data on the types of fluid that were used in resuscitating children. But currently, uh, there is actually a very large study, that's uh, international study that's going on um, that uh, uh, is being led uh, actually uh, out of Philadelphia called Prompt Bolus, and, and it is actually comparing normal saline versus uh, Ringer's lactate in terms of, uh, there's been evidence, of course, with uh, high chloride uh, levels potentially uh, impacting uh, uh, acute kidney injury. And so their, their primary outcome is MAKE30. And um, that study, this study has been funded in Canada and um, actually is being led uh, by Graham, who's somewhere here in the audience uh, in terms of the uh, national uh, PI for here in Canada. So I can't remember what the sample size is, but it's something crazy like 7,000 or something uh, astronomical which is amazing. Uh, hemodynamic targets, there's another really interesting study being led out of uh, the UK uh, by David Inwald uh, called the Pressure Study, and it is actually comparing um, permissive uh, uh, MAP targets versus uh, usual care, uh, and, and of course with the, with the expectation that uh, more permissive MAP targets will lead to lower use of vasopressors, and this could have uh, meaningful outcomes in terms of uh, in terms of uh, 
end organ dysfunction and other patient uh, important outcomes. So I actually just saw a tweet the other day that they've now enrolled 700 patients. So that's uh, excellent work. And I think they've got 16 studies recruiting in the UK into pressure. And then perhaps what I find most interesting and is also maybe the most complicated, especially in, in coming from a place where I've been studying a fluid restrictive approach uh, to septic shock, is the whole notion of de-resuscitation. I mean, some of this fluid we may actually need up front, uh, and uh, there may be no way of avoiding giving it, uh, but how can we actually de-resuscitate these patients to, again, try and avoid uh, the adverse outcomes that we know are related to fluid overload? Um, so as I had mentioned before, there's a couple of adult studies that have been published that, that looked at a, uh, a fluid sparing or fluid restrictive uh, uh, intervention um, uh, in the management of patients with septic shock. Classic uh, was published first. I believe that intervention was limited to just the first 24 hours of resuscitation and found no difference between uh, fluid restrictive versus fluid sparing um, resuscitation. And then more recently, Clovers, which was stopped early for futility and published earlier this year, uh, compared uh, an early restrictive approach versus uh, their usual care approach was more fluid liberal. Um, and again, was stopped early for futility. So squeeze will be coming soon, uh, not soon enough. I was hoping it'd be out already, but um, we're working on it. And then of course, uh, um, uh, start AKI in terms of de-resuscitation, early fluid removal, um, major publication uh, that's come out in the last, uh, not the last year, the last two years. So I was curious, so I went on clinicaltrials.gov to have a look and see what's actually currently being done in terms of de-resuscitation. And uh, when I selected for interventional trials, and just pulled this up yesterday actually, there were eight trials that popped up, uh, one of which is RADAR, again that's Canadian-led um, by John Marshall. And that's, uh, that's been completed. And then a number of others are uh, either recruiting or not recruiting yet. But what's interesting is, is how exactly you achieve your de resuscitation. Is this just through diuretic use? Is this through uh, re um, fluid removal uh, through CRRT? Uh, if it's CRRT, what, what exactly, what modality of um, how do you do that? Or is it some sort of combination of both diuretic use as well as, uh, as, well as uh, renal replacement therapy? So. Um, so this is interesting, and I, I think we're going to see more in this area. Sepsis biomarkers for risk stratification and precision medicine. I, I really think we're moving in this direction. Uh, and of course, um, many, many of us uh, uh, knew uh, Hector Wong, or certainly if, if, if uh, having not met him, are familiar with his uh, incredible work in this area. And um, and I know there's a number of investigators in this room that are, are doing translational and foundational research looking at uh, sepsis biomarkers. Um, so how those are going to be incorporated into clinical trials? Clinical trials are already complicated, but the notion of using biomarkers uh, to either risk stratify or, or uh, um, uh, a priori identify subpopulations that, that there may be differential effects of interventions depending on uh, what these uh, uh, these endotypes is 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 a very interesting area, and I, I do think that we're going to see some of that work coming. And then there's innovative trial designs, uh, platform trials, registry trials, and other innovative designs. And one of the major advantage of these designs is hopefully to save money because clinical trials are are expensive, and hopefully that will also help to accelerate work. So in summary, uh, I think the future is bright for sepsis clinical trials. There's, there's many important questions uh, that need to be asked that actually evaluate what we already do as opposed to novel uh, therapeutics. Uh, advances in trial methodology, statistical methods, and data management have paved the way for innovative trial designs in terms of data sharing and um, the large amounts of data that, that is required for that. Um, and translational research advances, I think, will inform new types of trials where biomarker profiles and risk stratification uh, will be used for subgroup analyses. Thank you.
are very passionate about getting um, translational samples embedded. And uh, I know the trial, the troubles we had in Squeeze, but maybe the audience needs to understand, you know, some of the the challenges, but yet richness that will come out of that embedded translational work into a clinical trial. Um, thanks, Allison. And, and yes, I should have actually mentioned that when I was talking about specific challenges. These are actually not unique to pediatric trials. But uh, I think if you're a trialist and you get your trial funded, you are very quickly going to be approached by translational re uh, researchers who are going to want to piggyback on your trial and get samples. So um, that is, uh, we should all be doing that. But in, in practice, it's extremely complicated. Uh, you know, lab managers, labs are typically hospital labs that are being utilized. You know, that's where these samples are typically going. Uh, and they're busy, they're busy running clinical samples. So for them to take the time or, you know, pull out the binder, remember this, you know, they got multiple studies to actually spin down. Some of these biomarkers are, are time sensitive. Certainly CFDNA had to be spun and, and frozen at minus 80. I don't know if Dr. Liao is in the crowd out there. But um, yeah, need to be spun down at two in the morning. And uh, I think I was actually phoning during the pilot at, at, at all hours. And I just, I can't do this in the definitive phase of the trial. I need some sleep. <laughs> we got to get these processes to work. But yeah, it's very complicated. And then there's more mundane things like, um, uh, labels on on your tubes and in a minus 80 freezer labels fall off I, I, if there's any translate people are laughing I think if you're a translational researcher you actually know this and I happen to know that these barcode labels are very expensive and so people don't want to pay for them but the problem is is actually if you don't pay for them you have labels fall off and those samples are irreplaceable and actually priceless so I mean, you know, this is not what you learn in, when you're taking your clinical epidemiology, like graduate degree. Nobody tells you about this stuff. But yeah, um, very important. But there's a lot of uh, practical issues in terms of communicating with the nurses, getting the right tubes. Do the tubes expire? Um, you know, children, how much blood is needed? So, I, Allison, I, I know there's more things to mention, but I, I actually could go on and on. But I know there's another speaker. I'm Ashraf Karad. I'm a neonatologist at Sinai. Thank you for this talk. I'm really looking forward to, to reading about um, the trial. I have a question about um, a pragmatic trial where you have a, a, a clinical arm, a, a trial arm that's usual care, and the heterogeneity of those patients on top of the heterogeneity of sepsis on top of the heterogeneity mm -hmm. of pediatric ICU patients. How, are, how do you make sure that you can make meaningful comparisons between the two arms? with those obstacles? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. I mean, you know, we don't know. I mean, in the pilot, we actually know that our fluid sparing intervention worked. Um, we, uh, this, the statistician was able to generate some data for us with, we actually didn't peek at any of the outcome data because we rolled the pilot trial patients in, which again, took almost two years to recruit 50 patients. So I mean, you know, to have to start back at zero again is, you know, that's very hard to do. So uh, we actually knew that the fluid sparing intervention worked uh, relative to usual care in terms of achieving fluid sparing. Uh, but you're right, the, that, that doesn't also answer the question of there can be temporal changes over time. And we certainly experienced that in Squeeze. And this gets back to the whole thing where, you know, everything is, I don't want to, you know, if you're not a pediatric person, you're maybe not going to agree that everything's harder in pediatrics, but it's definitely slower and I would say more painful that you do have to worry about temporal changes, uh, temporal trends, and how that could actually impact your usual care arm. So I suspect that we probably will get that question from the reviewers. We didn't have any a priori plans to actually look at that over time, but it is, it is a bit of a danger because as I told you, uh, when we were first starting contemplating this trial, I was told I was crazy because people were... It, there were questions about whether fluid sparing was, whether there was equipoise to do fluid sparing at that time. And now, you know, there's, there's a lot more tendency to actually just start vasopressors much earlier. And, and we actually have no evidence that that is, we know fluid overload is bad, but we don't know that starting vasopressors any earlier uh, is, is actually appropriate and leads to better outcomes.